Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the derivatives of our inverse trig functions. Uh, before we actually start finding some of these derivatives, I want to do a quick little review of some of these inverse trig functions. So let's go ahead and start with our inverse sine function. All right, so whenever we write uh, y is equal to sine inverse of x or arc sine of x, remember arc sine is just an alternative notation for inverse sine. What this means, and this is just coming from the definition of an inverse function, is that if we were to take sine of our y value, it would give us x. This function just undoes what the uh, sine function does. That's what it means to be an inverse. But there are a couple restrictions when it comes to what we're allowed to plug in and what comes out of this sine inverse function. So let's uh, try to recall that information. So remember, a function has an inverse that is also a function if that function is what we call one-to-one. -one. Uh, one-to-one means that every output comes from only one input. Uh, being a function also means that uh, one input only corresponds to one output. So when we say a function is one-to-one, -one, the inputs and outputs have that one-to-one -one correspondence. And graphically, a function is one-to-one -one if it passes that horizontal line test. And if we look at the graph of our sine function in the upper right over here, we can see that it fails that horizontal line test spectacularly. So we still want to work with that inverse sine function, but we won't be able to use the entire sine function to create this inverse if we want that inverse to also be a function. So we do for the sine function, as well as all of our trig functions, we restrict it to a smaller domain where it is one to one. And for our sine function, we always choose that domain to be uh, on the interval of x values from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So now if we kind of chop off the piece of our sine function that's outside of this interval, we can see that it is now a one to one function. It passes that horizontal line test. We can see that that horizontal line never intersects our graph more than once. And now that we've restricted the domain of our sine function, we can uh, look at its inverse graph. Remember the relationship between a function, or the relationship between a function's graph and its inverse is they're just reflections of each other over that line y equals x. And so now if we reflect our sine function on that restricted domain, we get the graph of our inverse sine function. And now we know what our inverse sine function looks like. So a couple things to note that we can see from the graph of our inverse sine function that we also should remember about functions and their inverses is that the, uh, the domain of our sine function became the range of our inverse sine function and the range of our sine function becomes the domain of our inverse sine function. Remember, the domain and range of a function uh, always switches when we look at the domain and range of the inverse function. So what that means for us is if we have a function uh, y equals sine inverse of x, this only applies for certain x values, the x values that we can see on the graph of our inverse sine function, and that's really coming from the range of our original sine function. This only applies for x values between negative 1 and positive 1. And so when we eventually find our formula for the derivative of our inverse sine function, that formula might only make sense for these x values. And we can also see that the range of our inverse sine function is from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. That's just that restricted interval we chose for the original sine function to make it one to one. So with that little bit of review of our inverse sine function out of the way, let's go ahead and find the derivative of our inverse sine function. And in order to do this, we're gonna have to use that process of implicit differentiation. All right, so now we're ready to actually compute the derivative of our inverse sine function. And the way we're going to go about doing this is using implicit differentiation. Uh, we actually always end up using implicit differentiation whenever we want to find the derivative of an inverse function, at least from scratch. So that's a good thing to uh, keep in mind. If you're trying to find the derivative of some new inverse function, you're probably going to use implicit differentiation. And so the, the idea is how we get started with the process of implicit differentiation here is going back to what we wrote as the definition of our inverse sine function. So if y is equal to sine inverse of x, then we know sine of y is equal to x. And the reason we rewrite this uh, relationship between x and y is, well, now we know how to take the derivative of this equation. So now we're going to differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to x. Now we are differentiating both sides of our equation with respect to x. We have to be a little bit careful on the left-hand side. 
if we're differentiating sine of y with respect to x, we have to think of y as a function of x. So in order to find this derivative, we're gonna have to use that chain rule. Remember the chain rule says, it's the uh, derivative of the outer function evaluated at the inner function, and then we multiply that quantity by the derivative of the inner function. So our outer function here is our sine function, and our inner function is y. So the derivative of the outside gives us cosine. We have to evaluate that at our inner function y. So, so far we have the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inner function. The final piece we need for that chain rule process is the derivative of the inner function, and we're just gonna call that y prime, at least for now. Remember this whole time, y is representing sine inverse of x. So this is the thing we really want. That y prime is our derivative of sine inverse. The derivative of x with respect to x is equal to one. So we have successfully differentiated both sides of this equation with respect to x. And now we can solve for our derivative y prime. And so now we do have our derivative of our inverse sine function. It's one over cosine of y, but we don't wanna stop here. We wanna express this derivative in terms of that input variable x. So now we have to figure out how do we write one over cosine of y in terms of x. And we could use some trig identities to help us do this, but I always like to use right triangle trig instead. They're actually equivalent and really it's just the, your preference. But here, let's go ahead and figure out how to write cosine of y in terms of x using a uh, right triangle trigonometry. And so to set up the right triangle we need for this, we have to go back to this relationship between x and y. Sine of y is equal to x. So if we try to translate this relationship into a right triangle, we have to think of y as the angle of interest in our right triangle. And then we have to remember uh, our sine function gives us that ratio of side lengths of a right triangle. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So we can think of x as like our opposite side length, and then we can make our hypotenuse a side length of one. That way we get this ratio of x when we evaluate sine of our angle y. All right, so sine of y is opposite over hypotenuse, that gives us x over one or just x. And now we're gonna need that missing side length in order to finish our work over here. And we can always use the Pythagorean theorem to find that missing side length. We know this side length squared plus this side length squared will give us the hypotenuse squared. So this unknown quantity squared plus x squared is gonna be equal to one. And so if we solve for that unknown side length, we should get that it is equal to the square root of one minus x squared. All right, so now that we have our right triangle established, we can go back over here and express cosine of y in terms of x, remembering that cosine of an angle is at the adjacent side length divided by the hypotenuse. So cosine of our angle gives us that ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. We found all of our side lengths, so now we just have to plug these quantities in. The adjacent side to our angle y is that quantity the square root of one minus x squared, and our hypotenuse is just one. So cosine of y really is just the square root of one minus x squared. And so now if we plug that into our derivative work over here, we have y prime in terms of x now. It's one over the square root of one minus x squared. So we have successfully found the derivative of our inverse sine function, remember y prime, is that derivative that we were looking for. So the derivative of sine inverse of x is always gonna be equal to one over the square root of one minus x squared. So a couple interesting notes to uh, point out about this uh, derivative. Going back to our discussion earlier, reviewing our inverse sine function is, well, if we look at the formula for the derivative of our inverse sine function, which x values make sense here? Well, we can really only plug in x values between negative one and positive one, which corresponds to the domain of our inverse sine function. 
can't actually plug in the endpoints because it's not differentiable at those endpoints, but differentiable everywhere else in the domain of our inverse sine function. And furthermore, what kind of number is gonna come out of this expression? One over the square root of one minus x squared. Well, it's always gonna be a positive number, right? The numerator is always positive one. And what comes out of a square root is also always a positive number. So the derivative of sine inverse of x is always positive. And if we think back to derivatives and how we interpret them graphically as slopes of tangent lines, um, this is saying, or one way to interpret that is, any tangent line you look at or any derivative you look at on our inverse sine function is gonna have a positive tangent line. And so that means our sine inverse function should always be an increasing function. If we look back at that graph we sketched or produced for our inverse sine function, it is always increasing.